Welcome everyone to our breakout session on GREE life expectancy. And today I am joined by Samantha Jimenez, who is Dominic's mom. And we're gonna ask her some questions first. Then we are, can the slides, slides, maybe. Oh, there we go, cool. All right, and then after that, um, I will be giving a brief introduction about the Curegrin mortality study that we are hoping to launch later this year. Um, discuss, and then we have a presentation from Dr. Stephanie Brock, who's gonna talk about prenatal and infant mortality in GRE related disorders. And then we're gonna have a testimony to our GRE Angels with a GRE Angels Memorial. So my first question for Samantha is, can you tell me about Dominic's life? Um, unfortunately, he had a very difficult life. He uh, was affected really day one. Um, he had GRIN1 and uh, was severely disabled and low functioning. Um, he spent most of his life in and out of the hospital. That really became our, our second home. Uh, very thankful for Phoenix Children's. They always made us feel comfortable and we got to know the staff and the physicians very well. Um, and really at home, we, we did everything we could to, to keep them comfortable. And you know, we did PT and OT and feeding therapy and vision therapy, but um, unfortunately he didn't make much progress with that. So we, we try to love on him as much as we could while he was at home and um, yeah. Could you please tell us about Dominic's journey to diagnosis? So um, from the beginning, he struggled with feeding. Um, he didn't latch well with breastfeeding. He didn't take a bottle well. Um, horrible projectile vomiting. He wasn't gaining weight. When I look back at pictures, it, it breaks my heart. You could see his rib cage. He, he was so tiny. Um, his pediatrician really worked hard with me with you know, changing formulas and different reflex medications and, and none of it really worked. And um, Around two months old, he started developing seizures, um, but they didn't look like typical seizures. They look like reflux with the arching and, and gagging and, and throwing up. And so um, thankfully he had one of those episodes uh, at the pediatrician's office and, and she immediately told me it was a seizure and, and called 911. And we then spent um, a month at Phoenix Children's um, doing every test under the sun, um, except for genetic testing. Um, a neurologist told me that he could tell by looking at my son that he didn't have a genetic disorder, which um, looking back, I can't believe he said that, but um, you know, we didn't have any family history uh, during that month. Uh, none of the medications were working. Uh, so we started on the ketogenic diet. Um, and at that visit, we uh, met with epileptologist who was fantastic and, and really took a, a long time to explain things to us. And he's the one that offered genetic testing. So myself and, and my husband um, and, and Dominic were swabbed and um, that was the most painful four months waiting to get those results back. Um, and when we did, there was such a relief to finally have a name to it. Um, and we found um, Keith's blog, which I think a lot of other parents did. And I just remember um, feeling a sense of connection finally and um, hope. And uh, thanks. <laughs> um, you know, we, I'm a nurse. I can tell that my son's prognosis wasn't good, but, um, you know, I, you still want to think that. Um, you know, coming to conferences like this and, and meeting so many families that uh, there's still hope for your child. So, um, sorry, I'm off track, but <laughs> that, so that's how he, he was diagnosed. Um, he, we, we got his diagnosis at six months, which in, when I, you know, meet a lot of other families, that's, that's very early. Um, so I'm thankful, thankful for that. Um, Cause that really did help us understand more and, and, um, be better prepared for what the future was going to look like. Could you tell us about the symptoms that Dominic experienced? Um, everything that was on um, uh, Dr. Kaufman's list, um, feeding issues. We had a, a G tube. First, we started with the NG tube. Then it was a G tube. Then it was a GJ tube. Um, horrible dystonia. Um, 
I think Dr. Kaufman mentioned one of the uh, children um, fractured their femur. And I think that was one of my biggest fears as Dominic was so strong, even though he had hypotonia, um, he wasn't able to hold up his head. He wasn't able to sit up, um, but his, his arms and his legs, he would have these very painful um, dystonic movements where he would flex and extend and, um, you know, we'd have to make sure everything was away from his arms and his legs um, so he didn't hurt himself. Um, horrible epilepsy. Uh, from two months, he was having 20 to 25 seizures, clusters of seizures a day. Um, that was very hard to watch. Uh, thankfully, keto dropped that in half. Um, but you know, as a mom, you, you keep pushing for zero. I, I thought zero meant he was going to make some developmental gains. And so I really pushed hard to get a, um, a VNS, a, a vagus nerve stimulator, because that was the next thing. And so um, I harassed uh, their corporate office. And um, for anyone that, that's familiar with that, um, they usually don't implant that um, in kids that are much older. And he was only five months old at the time uh, when I was considering that. And so again, um, a lot of people um, helped me and he was, uh, I believe one of the youngest to, to have that put in at nine months. Um, and that really reduced his seizures again. Um, but feeding um, was an issue, constipation. I know that's been a, a common theme here. Um, so we, we did it all. Um, daily suppositories, Miralax, you know, um, and, and really just irritability. He, he cried and screamed, um, all the time, which was hard. You know, you always try to, as a mom, um, take away their pain and not see them suffer so much. And, you know, for his whole life, um, he was irritable and didn't smile much. Um, when he did, it was gelastic seizures. So that was hard because it wasn't real. Um, so yeah, sorry. Thank you. This is hard for everybody. Yes. Uh, did Dominic have any significant hospitalizations or com uh, complications in the months or weeks leading up to his passing? Um, I mean, really, he was in the hospital probably every other month for, for respiratory um, issues um, because he didn't have a productive cough. Even the cough assist machine didn't work for him. Um, he had always sounded junky. We were constantly suctioning him. The common cold would put him in the ICU. Um, I knew his, his, we were on borrowed time. And so, um, once we got the functional analysis back from, from Emory and I took that paperwork and went straight to our neurologist and, um, really begging at that point for some treatment options, even though I knew that there was no guarantee. And um, thankfully, uh, Dr. Kerr, who is amazing, um, was on board and we worked hard to do a, um, an intrathecal magnesium trial where they put an epidural in his spine and push magnesium um, to get that to his brain. And um, that was one of the best days of my life. It's for a very short period of time as we kept doing doses of magnesium and they had them on an EEG and all this monitoring. And there were so many people in the room and I'm sitting there watching Dominic and he finally turned his head to me and smiled and um, he looked so calm and he wasn't tense. And, um, you know, it only lasted for a few minutes, but I held on to that forever. And um, we also did IV ketamine and that showed some, some promising results. And so it took a while afterwards to get all that data back and um, we decided to try um, oral ketamine first while we worked out the logistics of implanting a pump and, and, and all that. And so in the, the months before his death, we, we started, started oral ketamine. Um, and again, I, I didn't know what to expect. And I knew some other children had tried it and um, he was seizure free. And so I was so excited. We had never been seizure free before, but um, it came with horrible side effects. He, 
uh, insomnia was way worse than it ever was. He'd wake up every 20 minutes screaming. His dystonia was, was awful, um, but he was seizure free. And so I, I had held on forever thinking seizure free meant he was going to have a better quality of life. And, and, and that wasn't true. And so, um, you know, we'd have honeymoon periods for a couple of days where he was tracking better visually. He had CVI, um, and he seemed like he had some purposeful movement. And then, you know, for the following week, it was, um, horrible again. And so we, we kept, you know, adjusting his, his dosages, but, um, his dystonia just was not getting any better. And so I, I look back and think for, from September and until December, um, his poor body was just so exhausted and tired from that constant dystonic movement, even though we were adjusting his dose. And I really think that played a part into um, his passing. Could you please tell us what Dominic's last days were like? Um, we are fortunate to have um, pretty much 24 hour nursing care at home to take care of Dominic. And, my little sleep angels. Um, I don't know what I did, how we survived before them, but um, I remember the nurse knocking on my door in early in the morning and told me I had to run in and, and see Dominic. And he had very labored breathing and his sats were, you know, high 70s, low 80s. And he sounded horrible and he had a fever. And we took him into the, the ER and um, found out you know, the next day that he had rhinovirus, which is essentially a common cold. He's had it so many times before. So we knew the drill, normally steroids and oxygen and breathing treatments and suctioning. And then we go home in three to four days and we were so desensitized to it. Um, we kind of knew what to expect. And so um, it went just like that. And he started getting better and we weaned down on oxygen and he sounded better. And the doctor told me to go home and, and get some rest. And um, I never go home. I'm one of those moms that doesn't even like leaving the room. I have people, you know, bring me food because I don't even like going to the cafeteria. But um, that day I, I took them up on their offer and my husband um, stayed at the, the hospital. And at the time we had a, a six month old that I wanted to see because, you know, I had been in the hospital for several days. And I remember the next morning getting a call from my husband that he he tanked overnight and um, he was on high flow oxygen now, which is such a night and day difference from the day before. And by the time I got there, he was on a CPAP and, and wasn't doing well. And um, it all just happened so fast. And they told me they were gonna need a, to intubate him. And for me personally, um, I never would wanna see my son that way, but um, you never know, you know, when you're in the moment, um, but you can't judge anyone for making that decision. Right. So, um, of course, you know, we, we said yes, and they intubated him. And as soon as I saw him with the, the tube in his mouth and on the ventilator, um, I knew he was gone and he probably wasn't going to come back from that. But, um, my husband was so optimistic and I didn't want to take that away from him. So for two weeks, he was on the vent and he's so strong. He would do really well one day and, and do the sprint trials and be almost completely off the ventilator. And we were talking about, you know, discontinuing it or weaning off the next day. And then overnight he would tank again. And so it was just cycling on and on. And, and then finally, um, my husband and I got to a point where you know, we both made the decision that we, um, we need to take him off the ventilator and, and see how he does. And, um, he passed shortly after. Could you please share with us what led you to decide to donate Dominic's brain? Um, everyone in this room, uh, you know, we've all connected or a lot of us in this room have watched each other's kids grow up and and even though maybe this is the first time we're all seeing each other um we all have a familiar story and it hurt me and my husband every time we saw a child pass and uh, for those of you that know even Italia she was so close um to Dominic in so many ways and and when she passed 
that I knew Dominic was next. And um, when we went home after he passed, it was so quiet and so empty. And we just spent the whole night looking at pictures of Dominic and telling his story. And, you know, how are we going to explain this to his sister Sophia one day? And how do we want Dominic's memory um, to live on? And, and it was my husband that actually asked if, um, we could donate his remains and would researchers be interested in it as do I know of anyone and um, it was probably midnight and I emailed Keith and um, thank God he he read it and got back to me shortly after and um, by the next morning um, autism brain net reached out and and got the bill rolling and honestly it was um, it was an easy decision for me and in our family we we don't want anyone to have to go through um what our family did and no child should have to struggle like dominic did we thank you for making that choice yeah. and we're hopeful for the future of what dominic's brain and your donation and your family sacrifice will mean for our community uh, what are your hopes for the future um I hope that Dominic's donation, um, we donated his, his brain and his, his spinal cord tissue. And um, we also had cord blood saved when I was um, from his delivery. Something from that leads to more information um, for researchers that, you know, hopefully will lead to treatment or a cure. Um, uh, Thank you so much, Samantha. <laughs> I know you. that was extremely hard. There's not many dry eyes left in this room. <laughs> Thank you again, Samantha. Okay. Somehow I need to compose myself because uh, unfortunately, Samantha's only story in our community. So today I'm going to have a tissue. Thank you. All right. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about an introduction to Kiergren's uh, mortality study that we're currently in the process of planning. The first introduction to that is to discuss what is mortality. So mortality is considered the number of deaths in a certain group of people or in, during a certain period of time. It can be reported for people who have a certain disease, who live in a particular area, who are of a certain gender, age, or ethnic group. And we consider life expectancy to be a measure of the average time that a person is expected to live. Currently, according to the CDC, for any person, uh, the average life expectancy is considered to be around 76.4 years of age. So first, we're going to talk about mortality and other conditions. So uh, there was a study published earlier this year on Dravet syndrome. There were 281 individuals that had a confirmed SCN1A variant, which uh, correlates with Dravet syndrome, um, and these are in the residuous registry. Most of those patients actually had epilepsy data, so about 263 of them did. And essentially what they did was measured um, over the period of time, uh, there were a seven year activity of the registry. And during that period, they had five patients die, which gave them a mortality rate of, of about 1.4%. So 1.84 of a uh, thousand person years. Can we go back one? Oh, okay. I guess I didn't put the other one in. Um, there's another study uh, done on SUDEP earlier this year as well. Um, and that was a larger registry that also looked at um, the number of grin, uh, the number of SUDEP or sudden um, epilepsy deaths that are expected. Uh, it doesn't necessarily talk about um, a particular mortality rate, but some expected conditions that are also seen in relation to SUDEP. In terms of uh, grin deaths, um, there are the total number of deaths that have been reported to cure grin uh, is 19 and we have one patient within that where we are not aware of their variant, um, their gene variant. And so um, the average age of death that's been reported to us among those 19 patients is 5.7 years. 
The most common cause of death that's been reported was uh, respiratory complications, and some of the other reported causes of death included seizures and epilepsy, choking, suffocation, cardiac arrest, aspiration pneumonia, sepsis, sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, as, as well as secondary mitochondrial disease. And the countries that these deaths have been reported in are the United States, the UK, Canada, Norway, Latvia, and Australia. Oh, this was the other study I was talking about. So um, in this study with uh, SUDEP patients, there were 388 patients. Uh, they looked at autopsy of these patients. And the most common findings that they found within this group was neurological changes, cerebral edema and congestion, um, a previous TBI in some cases, as well as a cardiac pathology or nonspecific pulmonary edema. Uh, there was also a study that was published last year um, that had uh, multiple reports. So it was kind of a summary of different GRIN1 neurodevelopmental disorders where there was homozygous nonsense variants. And the phenotype for those patients was early infantile epileptic encephalopathy. There were also uh, reports of intractable seizures and a couple of reports of death in infancy. So this has been the only published study that I've been made aware of um, that reports some of these patient deaths. So to give a breakdown of the 19 patients that we've been made aware of uh, at CureGrin, 10 deaths of patients uh, had variants in GRIN1. Three of those were females, seven were males. The age range for that group was between 1.9 years and 19.3 years. So it's a pretty wide gap there. Um, the reported causes of death in three patients was respiratory complications. For one patient, it was choking. Uh, one patient, aspiration pneumonia, cardiac arrest in one patient as well. Uh, sepsis for one patient, um, seizures and epilepsy for two patients, and one patient where we haven't yet been made aware of their official cause of death. And so all of these reported causes of death are from the death certificate. So that's one interesting aspect about what we're considering when it comes to our mortality study to see if any of this can be directly linked to GRIN or uh, GRIN-related comorbidities. So for GRIN 2A, there have been four deaths of patients reported, two females and two males. The age range was between 10 months and 11.5 years. Um, for one patient, there, uh, the reported cause of death was suffocation. For another patient, it was seizures and respiratory complications together. Um, thus, one of the patients um, passed away from sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. And then the secondary mitochondrial disease was for one patient. For GRIN 2B, we know of three deaths, one female, two male. Uh, the age range was between 1.7 and 6.8 years. And the reported causes of death uh, was respiratory complications for one patient and intestinal issues for two patients. And for GRIN 2D, we know of one death of a patient with GRIN 2D. She was a female and she passed away at age 3.5 and the reported cause of death was epilepsy. So a little bit to share about our mortality study. So CureGrin Cure will actually be conducting an interview study in partnership with Combined Brain. Um, so we will be interviewing the families that have reported a, a death of a loved one with a GRI variant in order to better understand what related symptoms or comorbidities can result in death or early death. Um, are there certain types of variants? Are they gain of function or loss of function? Um, do, do those tend to increase likelihood for risk of death? Are there any variants located in a certain area of a gene to be more likely to increase risk of death? So some certain regions of the gene that we might wanna look at for where variants are located. And what are the most common causes of death in our community? So we, we've talked about a lot of them here, but a lot of that will go into looking at the specific death records from these patients and their clinicians. Um, and then what can we do as a patient community to raise awareness about certain symptoms or comorbidities in order to improve disease management and health outcomes? So that is what we are planning to do um, in the near future. We are going through the IRB process right now, and many of the families have fortunately uh, been excited to participate and to share their story with us. And we're very honored that they trust us with that. And uh, this is very hard. I know it is for all of you. And it is a great honor to serve you as a research coordinator and to be involved in this study and to honor these patients who have passed away and hopefully provide few, uh, hope for families for the future. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Brock. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, 
even if it is for a subject that is a bit uh, difficult to talk about, it's about mortality. And I'm not sure my slides are already available. Uh, so I'm, in the meantime, I'm mainly going to talk about a prenatal and infant mortality, um, which is a bit different from uh, what you've just heard from Megan. Um, so, okay, thank you. Um, so this is what I just said. Um, so when we just look at uh, neurodevelopmental order disorders in general, uh, we know that the mortality risk is uh, increased compared to the general population. And there's a recent study that showed that the um, standardized mortality rate is about three times uh, increased to, to the general population. And that risk of mortality seems to be significantly higher uh, in children that are younger. Um, so uh, there seems to be higher mortality risk before the age of 10. And then the risk seems to sort of even out. Um, and we see that uh, people with intellectual disability um, that about 60 years old, they have almost the same mortality risk as someone who doesn't have intellectual disability at 60 years. So there seems to be some sort of a survivor effect. Um, there seems also to be a higher risk of mortality in children who are severely affected by intellectual disability, uh, especially if there's additional neurological condition present, such as epilepsy, of course. And then uh, for ID, um, genetic disorders seem also to be a risk factor for mortality. So children who have ID due to, for example, for uh, perinatal complications, they have a somewhat lower risk of mortality. When we look at the leading causes of death, uh, there is some uh, conflicting data in the literature because the studies are not standardized. Um, but one of the main causes, and we have just heard it from Megan, seem to be infections such as pneumonia. Um, sometimes accidents are reported as well, uh, epilepsy, and some kids also have other congenital malformations, heart defects or uh, something like that. And that seems to contribute to mortality. When we look at mortality in epilepsy, um, this is also a very recent uh, study here, uh, came out in the beginning of this year, uh, that re reported uh, the mortality risk in developmental epileptic disorders. Um, they estimate that the mortality risk over a lifetime is about 8.2%, which would be a sevenfold increase. But in this study, um, different genes were included. Uh, from different uh, pathways. And it seems that the sodium channels uh, or sodium channel pathways, uh, which have a mutation in the, in the sodium channels, they have a much higher risk than any other genetic disorder uh, to die of epilepsy. So there seems to be a, 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 a difference uh, depending on the underlying etiology. Uh, interestingly, the study also included uh, patients with the variants in GRIN 2A. Uh, there were 14 patients, and they estimate that um, from their data that children with the GRIN 2A variant have a 14% risk of developing convulsive or uh, non-convulsive status epilepticus over a lifetime. So this um, puts them in what they define as a moderate risk category, which is of course a bit arbitrary because they chose to cut off, um, but it seems um, for them to be at least uh, not uh, negligible. Uh, interestingly also, this is a long-term follow-up. Uh, uh, they 14 patients, none of them deceased over time. So when we look now a bit more in detail at prenatal diagnosis and green, very, uh, green related disorders, this is something that is exceedingly rare. And today we only have data on green one for that in humans. And uh, yeah, I'm from Belgium originally. So um, in Belgium and in most of Europe, I don't know what it's like in the US, uh, we perform three major ultrasounds during pregnancy. Uh, the first one is about 11 to 14 weeks, where we uh, confirm that there's pregnancy, we see how many fetuses there are, maybe it's twin pregnancy, and we can already detect some major malformations that are often not compatible with life. And then we perform a second, um, second ultrasound, uh, about 18 to 22 weeks, uh, where we perform an in-depth screening for malformations, and that includes, of course, the brain. So um, 18 to 20 weeks, that's about uh, five to six months, I guess. Uh, so what you can see here is that the brain surface at that time is still uh, smooth. And only later during gestation, the brain uh, expands in size. So the gray matter develops properly. And then the brain starts to fold and you can see these uh, uh, undulations uh, occur, uh, which are the gyri and the salt side. So um, when something is wrong in the gray matter development, we might actually miss it at 
this second uh, trimester ultrasound because the, the surface is still smooth and we can't see it on the ultrasound. Um, when we take that into consideration for the, for the grand disorders, most of the children don't have a structural brain abnormality. So the, in either case, we would probably miss it on the ultrasound. This is quite important to know because that makes prenatal diagnosis very difficult for these disorders. Um, but there are some exceptions to that, and those uh, are very rare. But then we don't necessarily see these uh, abnormalities in the gray matter already at that early time, but we see uh, soft signs. One of the most frequent ones is what's called a ventricular megaly. Um, that's an A-specific finding. It's very frequent. It's about 1% of all pregnancies. And that means that the uh, cavities of the brain that are filled with the cerebrospinal fluid, they are dilated. And depending on how much this is dilated, it can be mild or severe, we can give an estimate on how neurodevelopment will turn out. Um, and this prognosis depends also on whether there are other malformations present of the central nervous system or of other organs. So what we saw was that there was ventricular megaly present in two fetuses uh, uh, in the second trimester. Um, and that's also as a warning sign. So we perform more, ex more exams than we, we infectious screening and then prenatal MRI and these kind of things. And it's most possibly easiest to see here on the MRI at 29 weeks in one fetus. You see that this space here is quite, uh, it's fluid filled because it's light gray. This is one of the ventricles that is severely dilated. That's highly abnormal. What you cannot see on the MRI is that this uh, dark gray line here, this is uh, gray matter. It's uh, very irregular for that uh, age, and it's also not symmetric on the two sides. But that led us to, um, um, to counsel the parents that the new development outcome of those two children might actually be severely affected. And we discussed it with the parents, and they ultimately chose to terminate pregnancy at that time. So this is very late, of course. And it was um, so when we suggest this termination of pregnancies and we discuss with parents, we also in, uh, in Europe, I don't know what it's like here, but we suggest to have an autopsy performed. And we know that this is a very difficult time to go through uh, terminating a pregnancy and then also talking about autopsies on your, on your child. Um, and we don't do that for uh, our scientific curiosity. We do this primarily to confirm prenatal findings, the ultrasound findings. Uh, for a person who performed the ultrasound, also for the parents, we've seen that this is re reassuring for them to know that there was actually something wrong. Uh, we were not just uh, seeing things. Um, we also used the autopsy to uh, get a better uh, understanding of, of the disease we saw uh, via imaging. And we can somehow um, sometimes extend the phenotypic spectrum. And we can use the information to pinpoint our diagnosis or differential diagnosis, and ultimately also help uh, the interpretation of genetic variants that they might find when perform genetic testing. This is something that can be quite useful also. And then, yeah, lastly, uh, an autopsy sometimes gives us some hints on the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms. And that was the case in these two fetuses, which uh, later we got to know that they had a heterozygous variant in green one. Um, so, and the autopsy findings here in these two videos suggested that there was a problem with gray matter development. Um, so, um, we look at the brains macroscopically, um, and this is a, a normal control at the uh, 25 <coughs> weeks. Uh, and when we compare to the, the green fetus, we see that the brain is already much smaller. And this is the temporal lobe, so on the side. Uh, it's also very hypoplastic. And when we look at the, um, this, uh, this cleft here, it's called the cilium fissure. Uh, it's complete, it obliterates later during gestation when the surface expands and then the, the gyra just uh, uh, close it. But here it's prematurely closed. So this is for us very abnormal at that time. And when we look at the microscope, so uh, I'm a pathologist, so I do that a lot. Um, so this is a normal control. This is what is the cortex, this is the region here. All the blue dots are the neurons. And from here to here, this is part of the white matter. And this is a normal version. Uh, it's quite yeah, homogeneous, it's flat. And here in this green one fetus, it's, it's quite easy to see. You have all these undulations here um, in the cortex. And that's what we call a polymicrogyria. Uh, so we have a lot of poly, uh, small uh, micro uh, gyra. It's, it's quite in the word, uh, how to call it. Uh, when we zoom out, so it's the slower magnification here. This is the cortex, um, this is the white matter, and this is a periventricular region, and that's one of the ventricles that was actually dilated. Um, 
then we see again you know, here is polymer quadraria. And what's interesting to see here is that uh, so this is a periventricular region. That's where some sorts of neurons are. That's where it's proliferate. And there is a, a pool of neurons that's generated. And these neurons from here, uh, under normal circumstances, have to migrate all the way through the white matter to the cortex, where they then form connections. And what happened here is that uh, these neurons got stuck in the white matter and they form these nodules, and we call that heterotopia. So these neurons never got to the cortex. Uh, this is another chart, and we have to see exactly the same. Uh, we see this polymicrogyria here, and also these nodules with the heterotopias. Uh, another thing we can do is what's called immunohistochemistry, where we use antibodies against different epitopes to characterize the neurons further. Um, and these, uh, we can see how they're differentiated, how uh, they are maturing. We can look at different time points. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but I'll make a summary. So from all the data, microscopy and microscopy and immunohistochemistry, we see that the three major steps of uh, cortical development of gray matter development are actually affected in green one variants. Uh, and the first step is a neurogenesis. Uh, and of course, when you don't have enough neurons, your brain is smaller. And that results in a microcephaly, so a small head circumference. Uh, secondly, we have the problem of migration. We saw that with the heterotopia, so these little nodules. And then, quite interestingly, and uh, I think it was discussed in some other expert sessions, uh, you see that glutaminergic neurons, they migrate uh, radially, so along a scaffold, and they just go straight from the white, from the periodic region to the cortex. Then we have interneurons uh, that are GABAergic, so not glutaminergic, and they migrate in a different fa fashion. They uh, have like a tangential fa way they follow, and they can cross barriers. So this is completely different. It's not like a long scaffold. And they were also abnormally located, and this migration was completely disturbed as well. And then lastly, we saw that the um, organization of the cortex was abnormal, and that's what this polymicrogyria is a sign of. Uh, so coming back to the prenatal diagnosis and what, what I actually was my topic, um, so we why is this so rare in uh, green disorders, uh, and especially in green one in that case? It's because these malformations of cortical development or MCDs are extremely rare in green one. Uh, it's about 10 to 15 percent of the patients, and they usually present, present with a severe phenotype. Um, and all of the living patients have severe seizures and most of them microcephaly in addition to the brain malformations. When we compare that to the, the vast majority uh, who don't have these MCDs, they seem to have a more variable and sometimes a more mild uh, phenotype. Now we, we published on that, and not only on brain one, uh, where we saw the fetuses now, we see these malformations of the brain also in green 2B. And they are completely fair. The, on the imaging, we couldn't make a difference. It was very, very similar. Um, we see in these T2 genes. So, a little summary. So, we see this. Um, this gyria or polymicrogyria on imaging. And um, I haven't told that, that till now, but there were other brain malformations present as well. And those affected the basal ganglia, the corpus callosum, and the hippocampus. And that's one of the gyria we uh, saw with the brain in green tube B. And here you really see this cortex is completely abnormal. The basal ganglia are really enlarged, and the corpus callosum here is uh, very hypoplastic. Okay, when we look more at uh, neonatal and infant mortality, so not anymore at prenatal mortality, um, we also included a few cases um, with uh, variants in green one as again, and they suffer from a severe epileptic phenotype. Uh, uh, we saw five children who um, developed uh, very severe seizures uh, shortly after birth and the first few days of life. And um, the seizures were resistant to uh, the AEDs. And all of these five children had uh, homozygous truncating variants. That means that both alleles in the paternal and maternal allele were affected by this uh, mutation. Um, uh, and what happened, and why is this important? It's a truncating mutation that inserts an uh, premature stop codon in the DNA. That means that um, when we look at the DNA as like a phrase, that uh, the protein we get is severely shortened, that means we have a complete loss of function of the protein. This seems to be a very severe spectrum of the disease. Um, and to compare this, we also saw uh, four individuals who had also homozygous variants uh, in green one, but they had missense variants. Um, so this leads to a much 
a smaller defect in the protein, uh, which can of course be as yeah devastating when it's located in an, uh, an important localization, uh, but it can also have a myeloid phenotype. So this is a huge difference uh, we see in the truncating versus missense variants. Um, in one of these uh, children with the homozygous variants, we performed also an autopsy. And uh, in contrast to the, the fetus, fetal cases, we uh, didn't see this polymicrogyria. We see what's called a simplified gyrocortex. That means that we microscopically already, we don't see the proper undulations. They are reduced instead of having too many and too small ones. So it's quite the opposite. When we look at the control brain, uh, we usually have six layers of neurons in the cortex. And that child, we only saw two. And these two layers were even depleted of neurons. And when we compared um, the findings of the simplified gyro, uh, gyro pattern in these homozygous truncating variants, uh, where uh, the neuronal depletion was really the major finding, uh, to the fetal cases where polymicrogyria and the aberrant migration was uh, um, predominant, uh, that might be due to an underlying uh, difference in the pathophysiological me mechanisms. Uh, nevertheless, we saw some overlap in the phenotype because both uh, um, groups had uh, corpus callosum and hippocampal abnormalities. Um, when we look at infamatality in the other grades, that's uh, a bit more difficult because there's not a lot of data. Um, I retrieved one study from a few years ago about GRI-A2 where two children have been reported uh, also with a very severe epileptic phenotype uh, shortly after birth. And they deceased at three and five months um, of pseudepsy and sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. And just interestingly, they carry the same variant, which seems to be very poorly tolerated. And for the other guys, uh, currently there are no reports on, on, on infant mortality. So in conclusion, um, Prenatal and early postnatal mortality in the cry rate disorder seems to be a very rare finding. Uh, and when it occurs, it seems to be associated with a severe phenotype, either with a malformations of a cortex in GRIN1 or with a severe epileptic phenotype and homozygous truncating variants in GRIN1 or in uh, GRI A2. Um, yeah, prenatal diagnosis remains very difficult and might actually at, at that point be a uh, limited to those who have structured abnormalities. As long as we don't perform genetic testing on every pregnancy, uh, we will not pick up most uh, children who actually are affected. And then lastly, um, these cortical malformations uh, seem to be due to their abnormal neural proliferation, migration, and uh, organization. Uh, so yeah, I would really like to uh, yeah, thank my collaborators, Anne and Catherine, with whom I've been working for a few years now, um, the other pathologists in France and in Belgium, um, also working with an organization uh, in Europe, which is specialized on cortical malformations, um, and then lastly, uh, Stephen Ferdinand's group, who, support, who supplied some uh, electrophysiological data for our study. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Brock. We really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through that and explain a little bit of pathology to us. Um, I don't see many questions in the chat, so I think everybody probably knows by now how to get to that. So make sure you go to communications and put your questions in there. Um, I did see a question related to the Kjurgren study asking if we would include GRIA deaths as well. Um, if we're made aware of those families, we would definitely be willing to contact them and learn more about um, what led to their child's death and include them in the mortality study. I'll, I'll open it up to the floor for questions for me or Dr. Brock. Dr. Brock, you mentioned for uh, GRIN 2A CSE or NCSE risk being non-negligible and perhaps I just missed it, but what are CSE and NCSE? Uh, it's convulsive and non-convulsive status epilepticus. Uh, so there's about a 14% risk they estimate for a grant 2A uh, of to develop a convulsive or non-convulsive status epilepticus over lifetime for a grant 2A. For the other grants, uh, we don't have any data at the moment for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I was wondering, so if I understand it correctly, then depending on, on uh, the variant you have, you, your, your brain is developed <laughs> differently okay. and, and some, uh, sometimes abnormal. Mm -hmm. Do you have any mechanism how, how this NMDA receptor 
is impacting this uh, this formation of the brain and basically the, the position of the neurons. And that's actually a great question because uh, we were wondering about this. Um, we were hypothesizing that that might be due to uh, the neuronal depletion, especially it might be due to um, uh, an toxic effect of the glutamate of some overexpression because the um, uh, the um, the fetus cases they had. Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the word to explain this uh, quite easily. So um, uh, we can uh, see that they they all had well, they had gain of function variants, uh -huh. and the the other child had a loss of function variant. So we were wondering if the um, toxic effect of too much glutamate might actually kill neurons very early in a step of development uh, when they are just formed, and then uh, so this might lead to the microcephaly uh, affecting the neurogenesis. And then the second mechanism we were uh, thinking about was that there might be a problem in the migration because, and also in the microcatrivary and the organization, um, because of uh, a link to the vascular network. Um, because we know that uh, on the blood vessels, we also have glutamate receptors. And uh, during brain development, uh, the vascular development parallels the neuronal migration and the neuronal development. And if one of the two goes wrong, um, the other one also goes wrong. We see that a lot in other disorders. For example, uh, polymicrogyria is not purely a genetic disorder. We see that very often in uh, children who have prenatal uh, stroke or hemorrhage. And then in the area surrounding it, we see uh, polymicrogyria develop. So this seems to be a link between vascular development and uh, structural brain defects. This is one of the help that we had. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and what does, does that mean for, for, for patients? Yeah, so I can imagine that if your brain is not developed the way it should, then you have little hope that medication can ever yes. fix that. Yes. Uh, this is uh, so this, uh, uh, children who are affected by this uh, structural abnormalities. They are a minority, but those are, might actually be those who will respond might less to treatment because we have an underlying restructural effect that we can't restore anymore. Once the uh, migration and the proliferation uh, is disrupted, uh, there's something we can almost impossibly treat. So it's something that's only in utero. And afterwards, there's no regeneration. Yeah. And the last question, did you also see this back in, in mice? So do, we, do we know um, for, for mice which variants? I'm not, not aware of any studies of with variants we saw uh, in our patients uh, um, that, we, that they tried to, to reproduce this phenotype. Uh -huh. uh, but we have mice models not for GRIN, but for other uh, genes uh, where we can reproduce this kind of cord malformations, yes. Okay. Yeah. And then sometimes happens, but not always. Uh, it depends on, on, on the on oh, underlying the effect, yes. We can really induce the malformation just by disrupting very poor microgyria, for example, by disrupting vascular genesis, and we can just pinpoint even to one um, zone in the brain, and then we get this poor microgyria there, and the rest is not affected, and it's not diffused, yes. That exists. Thanks. Okay, so I have a question about the brain malformation. Can they form later on in life or do we expect them early in infancy because my daughter had a brain mri when she was nine ten months old that was the start of the diagnosis process mm -hmm. we were checking if she has any brain malformations there was none so i was wondering if we recheck right now could there be something that you know we can find later on? Yeah. Now this uh, structure brain malformations, that's something congenital. This happens in utero. So this, if you have an initial MRI and it doesn't show this, then uh, it's probably not there. The thing is, uh, what we see, um, these are very rare disorders, and sometimes uh, radiologists are not very familiar with this. And so when it's very supple, it can be missed. It depends also on resolution on the MRI. But um, for what we have seen so far, uh, this abnormalities were very severe, so I think no radiologist would miss it when it's very severe. What can happen, and that's reported, is that progressively in the brain, you can get white matter abnormalities uh, in the absence of structure malformations, and that might not be uh, present on an initial MRI, so this can um, be different. Does that mean that's breaking that smaller one time? Because I kind of remember that Professor Lemke once said in one of his presentations that over time the, the brain of brain patients could kind of break. 
Yes, we can sometimes, as wherever we see that there is some sort of uh, atrophy, uh, we have some little bit of uh, volume loss of the brain. Um, um, there, there are some ideas on how this could work. Uh, one uh, theory is also that it's a toxic effect of the glutamate and the neurons die and then there's a shrinkage. Yeah, that can happen. That's something, uh, it's not a structure mathematician, it's more a, a, a really like a process, uh, uh, something we see also in neurodegenerative disorders where we have some sort of uh, volume loss. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of getting back to your question about um, stability of certain, uh, whether a child has a malformation, would you expect to see like if in a specific variant that an MRI would show up the same in each child that had that variant? Or would you think that you would see maybe one child has a normal variant, normal MRI with that variant and one child has a very, you know, an abnormal MRI and then the third child has another, you know, so that I'm kind of just trying to think like, is that, would you, is, how do you think about that or is it? Yeah. I think that's an excellent question. We saw, uh, I didn't include the, uh, the cartoon we have, but um, we saw uh, about 25 patients now with these MCDs. Uh, and there was some variant clustering, both in green one and also in green 2B. So in green one, the variants clustered in the pre M1 and the M3 region. Uh, for green 2B, it was the M3 and the M4 region. And that's most of the variants seem to be different from those uh, that are not associated with structural abnormalities. So there seem to be some um, hotspots. Um, but there was uh, one, uh, especially one uh, variant in green TB that was an exception to that, where we actually saw the variant in one child that had normal MRI and the other child had a severe abnormality. And we couldn't really explain this. So we were just thinking maybe there is some other environmental effect, uh, maybe there are some epigenetic effects. So we couldn't, we don't know why this is. But this was the only one, one, uh, one variant that was uh, present. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, just coming back to what you were saying a few minutes ago about um, there being a normal MRI at birth and then um, that there can be progressive atrophy that can mm -hmm. show up on an MRI later. Is that something from your experience that just continues to progress through the lifetime? So a continuous progressive atrophy. Um, and I guess part B of that question would be, is there a point where that atrophy becomes life-threatening? I think it's very difficult uh, to, to answer because we, um, we would need a long-term follow-up and with uh, the green variants only being detected quite recently, we don't have these very long-term uh, data. Um, and we also don't know why there's atrophy. We're still th thinking about uh, whether it's like really toxic effect or maybe it's related to seizures. Uh, we have uh, some atrophy due to seizures. So I don't know if, I really don't know what to, to tell you. That's, uh, I would be speculating and I don't want to hear. No. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brock. We greatly appreciate your talk. So we are going to play the Green Angels Memoriam video in just a second. The hotel would not allow us to have real candles. So we have a couple of electric candles. <laughs> here, do you want to set them up here? So people can see it on the video. Thank you. 
Thank you guys so much for your time and attention. Sorry for all the tears. Um, we greatly appreciate our speakers. Thank you so much again, Samantha and Dr. Brock. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you all.